So we're going to talk about how um, forensic DNA analysis works um, in a biotechnology sense, and we're going to talk about a lot of that. But first, before we can talk about PCR and STR and gel electrophoresis, you need to know basic of how DNA replication works. As a review from our previous lecture, DNA has four different nitrogenous bases. They're adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. The nucleotide order can be different. So in this example down here, we can see that we have adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. That is the order of the bases in that nucleotide sequence. Um, the order could just as easily be adenine, 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 adenine. So any sequences of bases is possible. Based on our model of the double helix for DNA, um, we know that certain bases pair with certain other bases, and we call this Chargaff's rule of base pairing. So notice that adenine and thymine always pair together, and guanine and cytosine always pair together. You always have a purine, which is a double ring structure, pairing with a pyrimidine, which is a single ring structure. When you think of two parallel lines, you think of two lines that are running um, parallel to each other. They'll never intersect. They're running right alongside each other. In DNA, we consider the two strands, the two sides, to not be parallel, but to instead be anti-parallel, meaning they're still parallel. They're not going to run into each other, but they're running in opposite directions. So we call this a five prime to three prime direction. And that's just how we label our end. So notice right here we have a five prime end of DNA going in the three prime direction. So if we were to label which end or which direction this DNA is going, it is going from five prime down to three prime. On the opposite side, if it were parallel, it would also be running down. It would go from five prime to three prime, but it's not. Here we see the five prime end is at the bottom and there's your three prime end. So it's running in an opposite direction. Notice here that our sugar is on the bottom of this strand, whereas our phosphate is the last molecule on this strand. And it is opposite for the opposite strand. Here we see sugar on the top and phosphate on the bottom. So they are running in opposite directions. Hydrogen bonds are the type of intermolecular force that holds together your bases. It is a covalent bond, so it's a weaker bond, um, but hydrogen bonds are the strongest of those intermolecular forces. Between guanine and cytosine, I see one, two, three hydrogen bonds, and between adenine and thymine, there are only two bonds. The nice thing about a hydrogen bond is it's strong enough to hold your two strands of DNA together, yet it is weak enough that you can break it apart pretty easily, um, which is necessary to separate the two strands as your DNA goes through replication. The nice thing about DNA is each strand acts as a complementary strand for the other or the template for the other. So each strand of your double helix has all the information you need in order to reconstruct the other half. So notice this bottom part right here is our template strand. I know based on the bases that are on my template strand, I know which base or which nucleotide I'm going to add to make a complete strand of DNA. So because I have a thymine, I'm going to add a nucleotide that has an adenine. Next on my template is a guanine, so I know I need to add a nucleotide that has a cytosine, and so on. So that first parent strand acts as a template, and it tells the um, replication machinery which nucleotide do you add so that you make your correct base pairs. In order for a cell to go through mitosis and to divide, it's going to need an exact copy of its DNA so that both new cells will have an identical copy of DNA. In order to do this, it goes through DNA replication. The process ensures that the resulting cell has the exact same set of DNA molecules as the original strand. Um, so let's look at the diagram here. On my parent molecule, they're both dark blue, just to show you the difference between the parent strand, the original strands, and the new strands, or the daughter strands. The first step is to separate those hydrogen bonds. So I need to pull those strands apart so that I can get my replication machinery in and add new nucleotides. This strand becomes a template for one strand, and the other strand becomes the second template for the second strand. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add nucleotides in each spot until I have built a full daughter side, a full complementary side to that DNA. And now you have not one, but two full daughter strands. Notice that both of these strands have a parent strand and a daughter strand. We call this semi-conservative replication, meaning I conserve part of the parent strand of DNA when I make my new strand of DNA. Generally speaking, uh, during replication, your DNA molecules will separate into two strands, and then we're gonna add in nucleotides that have complementary strands. We're gonna follow Shargaff's rules and base pairing, so A is always pairing with T, G is always pairing with C. Each strand of that double helix is gonna serve as a template for your new strand, just as we saw before. So here we are seeing that DNA separate, and we're seeing um, part of the machinery add nucleotides to your template strand until you have a new set of DNA. In the end, the result is having two identical DNA molecules. They're not only identical to each other, but they're also identical to the parent strand that they came from. Each DNA molecule resulting from replication has one original strand and one daughter strand. So looking at our diagram, we can see that the original strands, and again, they're dark blue, meaning that's your parent strands, they have a bunch of different origins of replication. So here's an origin, here's an origin, here's an origin. All that means is that's where replication is going to start. And right at that origin, you see the DNA molecule bubble up. It creates this bubble, and we start making the daughter strand in there. Well, those daughter strands, we're going to move along that string until all those replication bubbles um, combine into one. So see the replication bubble getting bigger here? Finally, in the end, we have two new daughter cells. Each of them has a parent strand, and that's the dark blue line on the outsides. And each of them is going to have that light blue strand, which is the daughter molecule. Um, and so basically speaking, this is how it works. And that, again, shows us our semi-conservative uh, model for DNA replication. So we've taken DNA replication and we've condensed it into six main steps. To get started with DNA replication, it's always going to begin at the origin of replication. It's a special site where you're going to start. So again, we have our origin of replications along the strand. You're going to see those all throughout a long strand of DNA. You would never start at one side and move all the way through to the other side because it's just going to take too long. The two DNA strands get separated, so it opens up what we call a replication bubble, and that daughter strand is going to be synthesized, and it's going to proceed in both directions until the entire molecule has been copied, as you can see in that bottom diagram. Okay, I'm going to throw a lot of words at you and a lot of definitions, and I want you to hang with me for a second because on the next slide, I'm going to use those same words and those same ideas in a diagram. So DNA requires a lot of enzymes. Remember that an enzyme is a biological catalyst. It's a protein that causes a reaction to occur. Um, at the end of your replication bubble, if you remember your replication bubble looks something like this, you had a replication fork. This area right here where it diverges is the fork. Um, helicases are the enzyme that actually untwist and separate those two pieces of DNA. So your helicase would be functioning in here, moving apart, breaking those hydrogen bonds between bases to open up the DNA so that you can replicate it. Um, an enzyme called primase, and remember that enzymes typically end in the ASE ending, that's how you know it's an enzyme, starts an RNA chain. RNA is different from DNA. Um, slightly. It's still nucleotides, but instead of having adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, we replace thymine. We do not have that with uracil, so you'd see used in cities. Um, essentially what it does is primase adds these little primers, these little pieces of RNA to the DNA sequence. And the role of that primer is to call over the DNA polymerase, which is the enzyme that adds DNA nucleotides. So the primer says, hey, DNA polymerase, you got to come over here. This is where you're going to start adding nucleotides. So it primes the parent strand for the daughter strand to start forming. The last enzyme you need to know is DNA ligase. DNA ligase is like a DNA glue. It glues together DNA nucleotides so that you have a nice continuous strand. So let's go to the next slide and see what this actually looks like. 
All right, so here is DNA replication happening, and um, here's the HeLa case that we were talking about. Your HeLa case is going to be ahead of everybody. It's moving towards the replication fork. Notice that this kind of looks like a fork. It's on your replication bubble. And this helicase is moving down this direction, breaking those hydrogen bonds apart um, so that you get two strands separated so you can get your enzymes in to start adding nucleotides and making a daughter strands. Primase is over here, and primase is adding an RNA primer. The reason it's red is because um, it is RNA and it's not DNA. We're showing DNA in blue. So it adds the primer. The role of the primer is to attract another enzyme called DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase is looking for primers. When it sees a primer, it says, okay, that's where I start. That's where I start adding nucleotides. So the DNA polymerase comes in and adds nucleotides here and here and here and so on. And it builds a continuous chain of DNA nucleotides. So it builds that um, daughter strand during replication. So the next two steps are involved with actually making that new DNA strand. We use that enzyme DNA polymerase. Remember, it's an enzyme because it has the ASE ending. We know it's an enzyme that creates a polymer. Remember, a polymer is a long chain made up of many, many, many monomers. Our monomers in this case are DNA nucleotides. We add a nucleotide, 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 and we get a polymer of DNA nucleotides or a strand of DNA. So this enzyme that makes these long strands of DNA comes in. It doesn't know where to start, so it's looking for a primer. Boom, found my primer right there. Here's your DNA polymerase in that lovely salmon color. Um, and DNA polymerase starts to add those nucleotides. Here I can see the daughter strands starting to form. It adds nucleotides according to Chargaff's base pairing rule. So if it sees a T, it adds an A nucleotide and a G with a C and so on. Your DNA polymerase has to have the primer to tell it where to start. It also has to have that template strand from that parent. DNA polymerase adds uh, DNA nucleotides in one direction. That is your five prime to three prime direction. So my new strand, it starts at the five prime end and it builds moving towards the three prime. And that is for the building um, nucleotide sequence, not for the template strand. So be careful you don't confuse the two. And we're going to talk more about that um, as we move into leading and lagging strands. I'll make a little more sense then. The last part of DNA replica replication to consider is anti-parallel elongation. So we know that um, DNA is running in in anti-parallel direction, two opposite directions. So what happens is you wind up with a leading strand where your DNA polymerase adds nucleotides to the three prime free end of a growing strand and elongates five prime to three prime on that fork. So if we look at our image here, here's our origin of replication. That's where your primer gets put down, your DNA polymerase comes in and adds nucleotides. It is going in the five prime to three prime direction and it adds that continuous. Notice that there's no breaks. Well, what happens behind the origin of replication over here, you cannot go in the opposite direction. I cannot um, add nucleotides in the five prime to th um, three prime to five prime direction. So what I have to do is I need to put down a primer every so often to attract my DNA polymerase to say, hey, come on over here, fill in these little fragments with DNA nucleotides so we can see that our new nucleotides are being added in that light blue color. Those fragments are called Okazaki fragments, and they make up the lagging strand. So we get fragments of DNA polymerase, um, fragments that are made by DNA polymerase. The RNA primer needs to come out, and it gets replaced with DNA polymerase, and then all of that gets glued together with ligase. And so the reason you have that lagging strand, you can see that the top strand and the bottom strand are different from each other. They're opposite. We have the lagging strand here. It's because they're running in different directions. So remember, you can only add from the five prime to the three prime direction continuously. Otherwise, you get the lagging strand where you get your Okazaki fragments. So the ends of your chromosomes, at the very end of your gene, you have this region called telomeres. And telomeres 
are um, these sections of repeating units of bases that don't code for any particular gene product. So they're, they're not going to code for an enzyme or anything in particular. It's just kind of junk DNA at the end. And the reason you have them is if you notice in the picture, every time you were to replicate at the very end of the DNA, you would put down an RNA primer, which is shown in red. Well, the primer says DNA polymerase come over and you can synthesize this new strand starting at the primer moving on. Well, when the primer comes off, it leaves this section um, unreplicated. So you have this, this piece that cannot be replicated. I can't put a primer in there because it'll block that whole area. And I have no way to tell DNA polymerase to come back and fill in that extra piece. So the next time, my primer is going to go right here. And I'm going to start here. So your piece of DNA on the very end gets shorter and shorter each replication. So instead of losing genes of interest or anything you need, you wind up losing these junk sequences or these telomeres. So your DNA can only replicate so many times before you use up all your telomeres and you would start to lose important information. That's when the cell would signal cell death and you'd no longer um, be able to replicate that piece of DNA anymore. The enzyme telomerase is what adds telomeres to the end of that segment of DNA. So it continues adding it. Um, it will not do that forever. It does have a certain time span. Interestingly, cancer cells make their own telomerase, meaning they can continue to add telomeres to the end so the DNA can replicate and replicate indefinitely those cancerous cells. If we were to start replication at one end and work until we got to the very other end, it would take far too long to be useful in our body. So instead, we have a bunch of sites in the center of DNA called the origins of replication where DNA is going to start replicating. It'll open up that replication bubble and your enzymes will come in and start adding nucleotides and making a daughter strand. And the nice thing about this is the bubbles are eventually going to get larger and larger until they grow into each other and you wind up with two daughter DNA cells or two daughter DNA molecules. Um, and this is a lot faster way to copy than to go from one end of your DNA to the other. So the end result of having two copies of DNA is that now that we have duplicated our DNA, the cell can go through mitosis or cell division. So here in this image, we see cell, the cell has copied its DNA. It now has two identical copies. Um, and it's going to go through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, finally separating those two distinct copies of DNA into two separate cells. So now we have two cells that are identical not only to each other, their DNA is also identical to each other, but they're also identical to the parent cell that they came from. And the same thing goes for meiosis. We have a duplicating event in the beginning of meiosis, and then it goes through not one, but two cell divisions having the chromosome number at the end.